Hey, I'm Carly Peltier. Um, I'm a PhD student at Columbia University. I really regret not being able to be there for these presentations in person. I'm teaching a class that finishes at the end of the month, and I really look forward to joining you all in not too long. It's a real privilege to be able to work in Chile as someone who studies glaciers and past climate. Um, there are some really great glacial records and some amazing scientists in Chile doing really cool work. During my Fulbright, I'll be working with Dr. Esteban Sagredo and his PhD students, Rodrigo Soteras and Scott Reynout, as well as Dr. Patricio Moreno. Um, so I'll start with an introduction of the broader problem that we're trying to address with this research, and then I'll get into how I plan to use glacial moraines, like the one that we're standing on here in this photo, uh, to create terrestrial records for the climate conditions of the past. It's been well established that summer temperature is the primary control on glacier change, and summer temperature is controlled in part by summer incoming solar radiation or insulation. So insulation should be a control on global glacial cycles. And we have some nice data sets that show that ice sheet volume is well correlated with northern hemisphere insulation intensity with little to no lag. Um, but insulation intensity is out of phase between the two hemispheres, which is shown um, in, the, in the red and the blue curves, where the red curve represents insulation in the southern hemisphere and the blue curve represents um, insulation in the northern hemisphere. Um, and they're, um, they're pretty nicely out of phase, meaning that if insulation were the only control on glacier change, while northern hemisphere glaciers expand, southern hemisphere glaciers like those in Chile would retreat. And then the curves in the panels below represent the probability distribution you would accept, expect given um, three scenarios. Um, so the first is that glaciers in Chile are linked by some global feedback to the northern ice sheets and vary according to the northern time scale. So we would see glaciers advancing in Patagonia when insulation in the northern hemisphere is low. Uh, alternatively, the um, second hypothesis is that glaciers in um, Patagonia vary according to local insulation. So when the red curve is at a minimum, we we would see glaciers expanding here. Or the third possibility is that um, these glaciers care more about some other driver. Uh, we may find that the marine distribution doesn't vary according to either insulation signal. Um, so there's some fundamental piece of the climate puzzle that we're missing, and documenting uh, the differences in timing of glaciation around the globe and in, in Chile, where we have these great records, is really key to solving this climate puzzle. Um, I think we're all familiar with photos like these showing how glaciers have changed since the Industrial Revolution. Um, this shows a, a glacial moraine uh, deposited around 150 years ago. Uh, glaciers are very sensitive to climate changes, so we can use um, records of past glacier change to infer pa past climate change. Um, and glaciers also deposit moraines when they advance. Um, so these, these uh, piles of sediment and rock are moraines. Uh, so we can identify sequences of moraines like this one. We have M1, M2, um, marking the past positions of the glacier. Um, this is from uh, Lago Polena, uh, from preliminary work that Rodrigo Soteres and Ma Marteo Martini uh, from the University of Córdoba and I did in September. Um, this is a preliminary geomorphic map which Rodrigo Soteras constructed. We've collected um, we've collected a bunch of samples from here um, and processing those samples is one thing I hope to do um, 
so we can get dates for these marines. So for for a long time, geologists have been able to identify these sequences of, of marines, like these um, red ones here, um, but haven't been able to say when they formed. So we know that the glacier was um, was big during multiple events, but they weren't they weren't able to say when those events were. Um, but in the past few decades, this new method has developed that allows us uh, to date these marines called cosmogenic exposure dating. Um, the atmosphere is constantly being bombarded by cosmic rays, um, which are primarily neutrons and muons, and they react with the upper few meters of the Earth's surface and produce cosmogenic isotopes like beryllium-10 in uh, the mineral quartz, which is a common mineral in many rocks, uh, especially in Patagonia. We can quantify the number of these beryllium-10 atoms and, and then figure out how long that surface has been exposed and thus how long ago the glacier left this spot. Um, so we sample the upper few centimeters of a rock deposited by a glacier on a marine with the goal of getting a piece that's been exposed since that boulder was deposited. This is a photo of me drilling into a rock at Lago Palena in September with Mat Matteo Martini here. Um, and then we take that rock sample and we extract the beryllium from the rock. Um, finally just get pure beryllium oxide um, and count how much beryllium there is in each sample using a mass spectrometer which gives us the exposure age of that rock. So just a quick outline of, of my goals. Um, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail in a second. Um, uh, so I plan to, to finish my work at the Strait of Magellan and um, uh, continue at Nidehau as well as uh, Polena. So we applied this technique to the southern tip of South America at the Strait of Magellan. Um, uh, so the Strait of Magellan and Bahia in Util here. Um, these Strait of Magellan and Bahia and Util owe their modern morphology to past advances of lobes of the Patagonian ice sheet extending into this area. Um, the Patagonian ice sheet is outlined here in purple. Um, this is what it, it, it might have looked like 20,000 years ago um, during the peak of the last um, glaciation. And the modern ice fields are in white with the southern Patagonian ice field and the northern Patagonian ice field. So this is what's left of the Patagonian ice sheet. And then the white arrows here mark the schematic direction of glacial advance into these valleys. So Rodrigo uh, Soteras, Jose Arauz, um, and my advisor Mike Kaplan spent a week in the Strait of Magellan here sampling boulders um, and analyzing them to create this record of glacial retreat from the area of, of glacial maximums. Um, and um, what we found was that the glacier here advanced during a time when we didn't quite expect it to. Um, when it doesn't seem like the big ice sheets in the northern hemisphere expanded. So um, in the winter, when it's when it gets too cold to work uh, in the field in southern Chile, uh, Rodrigo and I will work together to publish two papers uh, on the Strait of Magellan, one uh, more focused on the mapping and another more focused on the chronology. Um, and so Nirehau is a site a little bit farther to the north, um, which we've just finished most of the chronology for, but it's never been mapped. Uh, so before it gets too cold, I'm planning to, uh, map the glacial geomorphology, uh, with the help of Esteban, who's really an expert in this field, um, so that we can say which marine crests connect to which, so we can, so we can identify nice, um, sequences of marines. 
And finally, I'm planning to do some glacier climate modeling with the help of Esteban, who's done some of this, who's done some modeling work. Um, so we can figure out how much colder and wetter it had to be from, um, from these ice sheet models. Um, how much colder and wetter it had to be to allow the glacier to grow to the extents that we figure out from the mapping and the chronology. The Patagonian ice sheet is important for sea level rise and as a natural resource and water resource. And it's really important that we understand what controls the variability of these glaciers in order to better predict how they're going to um, behave as, as we warm the climate. Thank you for your attention and I really look forward to meeting you.